Hi there, my name is Scott Phillips. Today I'd like to go through some observations on how to maximize value as a founder of a medtech startup. I'm using data that I obtained from a Swiss researcher, Eri Libre. I just like to call him out. And these are the companies that he looked at. In fact, he got the data on about 500 startups, but we're going to look at the 22 of them that were in the medtech space. And what uh, unified them all is that they all went to initial public offering. So we have access to a lot of their data which makes uh, an interesting ability to compare how their stories ended up for the different founders. Nobody really talks so much about this. It's a relatively uncommon topic. But how did those founders compare in terms of exits? We have data that resulted uh, anywhere from $160 million outcome. And that was a, a special case of Alfred Mann for Second Sight. He probably put about that much of his own money into it. So it's a bit of an unusual case. So that was $120 million. And 60 million for a couple of cases, down to sub $1 million. So dramatic range of outcomes for different entrepreneurs. And so I became pretty curious. What was it about what each of these uh, founders did in order to, to influence the outcome? So the first question I really, I really thought was, maybe it's how long it took. That if it took a long time to get to IPO, maybe they would be, uh, have less value. And so this is the result of that. You can see there's really not a correlation at all. I can't see any correlation. Uh, one thing that's interesting, if you look at the data, is you can see that the, the number of years to output out uh, to IPO was as short as four and as high as 17 years in this study. Average looks like it's around 10. So it's, it takes a while to get through, get a med tech company all the way out to an IPO. So then next thing I thought, and it seemed pretty obvious, it would relate to the amount of dilution in your A round. So uh, let's take a look at that data. And it's a little disappointing as well. In fact, I can't really see a correlation at all. The amount of dilution in A round uh, averages at around 55 or 60 percent. And in terms of the outcome of the founders, almost no correlation at all. Now, this is not the very first uh, friends and family round or angel round. This is the first uh, A round probably funded by a venture capitalist in the multiple millions of dollars. But even so, uh, you can see the extreme of 90% uh, uh, dilution. In, in that particular case, the founder got almost nothing at the end. So, uh, but that's just a single data point. So it's, it's a little bit hard to, to say. But this was a surprising outcome, that the amount of A round dilution is not strongly correlated with the total dollar outcome of the founder. So the next premise was, maybe it's actually the total amount of venture capital that they raised. So they needed more money. Uh, that would give them a better outcome. So you'll take a look at this data. You can see the actual highest venture capital amount raised was a company called InfraredX. It was about uh, $230 million or so. Uh, that one actually did not successfully IPO, so we maybe should even take it out of the data set. You can see a bit of a hump in the middle. That would be indicating that for the companies that had medium-sized outco outcomes for their founders, they'd actually uh, raised a substantial amount of money. Although the the, the ones who did the best actually didn't raise that much, and the ones who did the worst didn't raise that much. So that's a little something to take on board. So the next thing that I thought about was, maybe it's actually the exit value. How much was the company worth at the end? So I, I did a chart of that. Uh, we see a pattern a little bit similar to the last slide in this case. Uh, we have cases sort of in the middle. A lot of the biggest uh, exit values resulted in medium-sized out outcomes for the founders. Um, the, you know, the founders that did the very best didn't have the very biggest exit values. Um, but the, uh, the founders that did very poorly also didn't have big exit values. So uh, that's another interesting thing to take into account strategically as you contemplate what venture to take on and what exit value potential it has. So the last thing I looked at was actually exit multiple. And now we're starting to get somewhere. So exit multiple actually has a, seems to have a strong correlation, uh, not one-to-one -one by any means, but there's, there's uh, definitely a lot more, uh, more uh, exit multiples towards the left side of the chart where the big exit values of the founders were. And this one is, uh, again, it's about uh, selecting the right venture. It's not going to take that much money to do, and when you get there, you'll be able to sell it for a large multiple. And we see multiples in the range uh, 40 to 50 at the top end. That's a, that's a large multiple, right? So the first case we're going to look at is a company called Cambridge Heart. 
which started in the early 90s in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Boston, and Dr. Richard Cohen. And so you can take a, if you take a look at the data, you can see that he started with 1.25 million uh, founder shares. And in February of 93, he sold off 6.5 million uh, uh, shares at a dollar each. So he got six and a half million dollars, and, uh, and he sold off the vast majority of his company. Uh, but he was able to move forward, and just over a year later, he sold another 2.3 million uh, shares in the company uh, with, uh, at a dollar fifty, so a little pop, about a 50% pop in value over that year. And then at that point, he'd raised just over $10 million. And the company exited uh, for $167 million. So that sort of exit multiple covers a lot of sins, right? Uh, you got a 17x return on total money in, and, and Dr. Cohen himself uh, walked away with $17 million. And you can see that if the exit multiple had been lower, he would have got proportionally less. He could have ended up with two, three million. There's nothing to sneeze at, but if you're doing a significant innovation in medical tech and you're taking all the initiative and, and taking all the stress on and, and at the end you're being successful, you'd hope that you'd find a way to be successful. So this is all driven by that exit multiple. So let's look at the next case. This is a pretty famous company, Intuitive Surgical. This one also goes back to the 90s. And it started in December 95. And the founders had 3.4 million shares between them. And at that point, they sold off uh, 5.4 million shares for a total of, uh, at a dollar each, for they'd raised uh, $5.4 million. And then about uh, just over a year later, uh, they raised uh, at $5 million, so a giant pop. So over one year, they made their company be worth five times as much. And so they raised uh, 6 million shares for $30 million proceeds. And now they're actually starting to get somewhere, right? And the value at that time is 74 million. They've, they're raising money at a much higher valuation. Uh, then they raised at eight, then they raised at eight again. And by that time, they had raised a total of $93 million. And then they went public. I'm not exactly sure when, but roughly a year or so later after that. And they went actually public at $9. So all those investors who got in at $8, million, at $8 valuations, um, they got a very nominal return. The founders themselves, uh, they exited uh, 30, at $30 million value, which was about 10% of the total venture. And there were several founders, so, so I suppose each of them got $10 million, which is, which is great. The interesting part is they exited at a total value of $300 million. And today, that company, as, as a public company, is worth something in the range of $65 billion. So there's something in the range of 200x return available for people who stuck with that company. But people who got in and, and took that early uh, startup ride didn't necessarily do that well. The next story I'd like to talk about is Infrared X. It's a bit more of a cautionary tale, and that was that one I was talking about on the right-hand side of the chart. So you can see what they did here. They, it's a bit of a different strategy, a smaller number of higher value shares. Uh, so the founder got 10,000 shares, um, and their A round, they actually sold off 174,000 of them for 48 bucks each, uh, and got $8 million. Then they raised at $130 each, and then they raised at another, another round of 130 and another one, and another one. So they actually had four rounds that were flat. More and more dilution for the founders, and then things weren't working out that well. And what the device does, it's an, an intravascular ultrasound system to characterize lesions in coronary vessels, or I guess any arterial vessels. And then they had some down rounds, 72, then 24, then 17, then 16, and ultimately, the company filed for IPO but was not successful. So what can you take from that? I guess in some measure uh, the insight is obvious. You want to avoid a down round, but uh, evidently their, their value proposition didn't pan out the way they had hoped, right? So they spent a lot of money trying to show that they had a substantial value proposition. I don't actually know exactly what happened in their clinical trials. Uh, uh, what caused the degradation in their share price. But some, some, uh, some companies win, some don't, right? And we'll talk about that in a sec. So I'd like to segue now into some reflections on about uh, 45 or so of our clients that we've looked at over the past. And I'm not gonna 
uh, highlight particular stories uh, for confidentiality reasons, but I like to talk sort of in aggregate or some of the things that we've observed. So let's take a look at this chart. This is, this is a chart we use uh, just to uh, capture the fact that there are a number of phases in a, in this, in a project. And in some uh, measure, it's the phases of a venture as well, right? And the first, uh, first part, we call it phase zero. That's a conceptual development. That's their venture design. That's your selecting what product you're going to go after and looking at it from a number of different perspectives. And those perspectives, I have a subsequent slide to talk about, but they look at, you know, obviously what is your core value proposition? What is the uh, situation in IP? What's your regulatory path? What clinicals would be required? Uh, what's the reimbursement environment? Um, why is this thing going to be so uh, important from a workflow and clinical benefit perspective that it's worth people changing how they do their clinical practice and so on? And then we go through and uh, uh, to you, you identify your critical risks and you try to mitigate them as best you can at that stage until you're convinced and you can convince really astute observers that you've captured the essence of it uh, and this venture is worth doing. And, and there's a decision point at that point. And I think that's what we've observed, companies that are very uh, successful and entrepreneurs that are successful uh, at serial enterprises, they, they actually separate themselves a little bit from their venture. They don't think that this venture is their destiny. What they see is that they have to perform a series of experiments to dial in the venture as best they can and then to decide is it good enough to go to the next stage or not. And if it's not, then they just cut and move on. So the first one of those big, uh, big gates really corresponds to a financing event, but it's allied with uh, all those uh, proof of concept kind of questions. Can you answer those? And can you see that company as a series of experiments? So as I mentioned, that series of experiments largely tends to line up with the financing events as well, right? So once you've identified the critical risks, you've done benchtop experiments or user uh, research or uh, intellectual property, so various things, and you can answer yes that all of those things seem to be panning out, then your ability to raise capital is much, much enhanced, right? So people tend to raise capital at that. That's one of the things. And then from there, we would build a, say an alpha prototype, which would demonstrate the clinical uh, uh, principle in some way. It would be a thing that looks like the real device, and you can give it to surgeons or nurses or air ambulance attendants or, or anybody that's appropriate for your type of device. And there would be again. And, uh, and then you can perform some uh, appropriate verification validation or cl some clinical workup on it. And right in there, you got another valuation pop. And interestingly, the questions that you're addressing are in fact largely similar questions to what you're addressing in that first round. So you can see where the stars are in this chart. That lines up with when you need to raise capital. You're going to raise capital, what the finance people like to talk about as inflection points, or where do you get a, a substantial valuation increase? And I think that is the essence of the success of how to align with product development and make your whole venture work is you want to do as little as possible to make the company worth as much as possible at the right times and it's a whole cascade of value you're trying to line up. So let's take a look at a couple of those things that are in that early round and you'll see that they're echoed later on as well. So we're looking at intellectual property and identifying what we think the core strategy is, what we think the value proposition and how, what's the available landscape IP that we could claim for ourselves and what IP do we need to work around. Human factors, ergonomics, we believe that venture success is at least as driven by ergonomics and usability as it's driven by technology possibilities. Uh, when we look at workflow, we look at contextual research, understanding who's doing what during that procedure and how can we enable that to work better and can we rethink it a little bit to actually give them more value than they, they realized was possible. We look at reimbursement strategy. Uh, we're not reimbursement strategists ourselves, but we, we better know what reimbursement we're trying to align with. Uh, disposable strategy, probably you need to have a way that your device, somebody pays for its use every time because that business model is a lot stronger with any sort of investors. Uh, how are you going to service it in the field so you don't spend, send people out in the field all the time doing expensive service calls that you could be doing from your computer in the office? How are you going to get through clinicals? What is your whole strategy for minimizing the risk of clinicals? They're very expensive. Uh, it takes a long time to recruit the patients. 
Uh, you better make sure that the right patients and all that. And how do we design the device and the, the right stage of device to use for those clinicals? So there's some strategy there. How do we design for the sales uh, distribution channel, which is all tied into your whole go-to-market strategy? There's aspects of designing the right device for that. How do we design it to have the right margin? This is something that uh, I'm surprised how often uh, we end up having discussions about. Generally, our rule of thumb is you need roughly eight to one. If you're selling your device for $10,000, you got about $1,200 worth of cost of goods that you can direct cost of goods, which will cost you about $2,500 uh, out of manufacturing, just as a raw, raw, rough rule of thumb, sterilized in a box ready to go to the customer. Design for manufacturability, are there any critical risks there? Of course, it's all driven by a risk framework. And then, of course, how great can the technology be? And, how, and there's any elegance that can be found in the implementation of that core technology into the real thing. So, you, so we take a very holistic view. And so you take your best crack. You, somewhere in there, there's going to be a bunch of risks, and there'll be the critical risks in your venture. And how can you mitigate those as, as well as possible in that uh, phase zero or, or, or uh, proof of concept stage? And then, uh, then you're going to have to refine those some more when you get through the alpha, and then you're going to refine them again some more when you get through to the beta, which is your really design for manufacturability, designed to get through your regulatory path uh, device. And well, I think what's kind of interesting here is if you think about those as a mixing board, so I've got a slide here that shows that how much do, does each of those things matter? I mean, the, the challenge is that you're going to have about 15 experts all giving you well-meaning advice, and all of them are telling you that their thing, which is regulatory strategy or which is reimbursement analysis or which is uh, clinical or, you know, which is IP, that's all, each of them is super important and, and all they need is about $5. The problem is that you only have $10 and you've got about 15 of those people. So you don't actually have the luxury of giving everybody the amount of money that they were they claim is required. So I wish I could give you general purpose advice for exactly how to, how to adjust your mixing board, but actually it's very different depending on whether it's an orthotic, say, or whether it's something that finds brain cancer, or whether it's an intravascular device, or a heart valve, or an assay technology that's an adjunct to a surgery, or a drug diagnostic, or a companion diagnostic. Um, that's all going to be very particular. And your best bet is to find someone that has worked in that field before, hopefully done a venture before, get them on your board or on your advisory board, and they'll advise you the best way to allocate your scarce resources to get the valuation pop. Um, we have seen a number of cases where people are busy working on design for manu manufacturability and somehow convince themselves that, uh, that all the technical problems that they're having are appropriate for that stage. But in my view, in many cases, those risks could have been identified uh, and mitigated on a bench top before they started spending so much money on the latter stages. And maybe they would have actually designed a different device had they pursued a risk-based approach. It's not just about spending the money. It's about your dilution, right? So remember, the whole goal here is you as a founder are going to get the best exit possible. And your early investors are going to get rewarded for going along in this journey with you and not get crushed later on when your more sophisticated investors realize that there's, there's blank pieces of the canvas here and you're going to have to spend more than you expected and so on. So how much of each thing and when? And the uh, simplistic advice I would have for you is just enough. Uh, this really follows a methodology of organizations like Creative Destruction Lab or the Lean Startup. How do you see that company as a series of experiments and how do you strategize to cover your biggest risks and only, and only deal with them just the right amount so that your scarce dollars are stretched uh, to give you the best valuation. It's got to be an honest valuation, right? Because at some point, the chickens are going to come home to roost. And if you've been lying or you've been uh, misrepresenting the risks, and then those risks show up later, we do have a list of some of these things you can take a look at. If you'd like to contact us, we're happy to send out a list we've prepared for what things you th should think about as a sanity check for, uh, for your proof of concept. And hopefully that will allow you to identify a couple risks that you may not have thought of so far. Another point that I would make based on our experience and talking to a lot of serial entrepreneurs is that once you've got your first venture under your belt and you're moving on to your second and third, 
you've returned capital to investors the first time out, uh, all of a sudden term sheets start looking a lot more friendly. They start to trust that there's, there's a lot of good things going on uh, under the hood. And it's a lot less bells and whistles, a lot less liquidation preferences um, and other clawbacks and so on that, that, uh, that uh, venture capitalists bake into, the, uh, into their term sheets to make sure that you're aligned, as they say, which really means that should you fail to meet any of the promises that you've made, then, uh, then it has substantial consequences. So uh, really they understand that nobody's got the foresight and the wisdom to know exactly what milestones they're going to hit. Um, so, uh, but they'll just give you a little more rope when it's your second and third venture. So let's take a look at a few examples. I think people who've done this really well, they're able to sort of see down through that whole cascade of dilution and build up substantial value. So here's a fellow named Amr Salier. He's based out of the San Jose area. He's worked in a number of companies. He really specializes, and I think this is an interesting observation. Some of the people who have been really successful in this space have decided to uh, have sort of, they found a sweet spot in the industry, and in his case, tends to be interventional cardiology type applications. He's done a number of startups. Sadra Medical, for example, was a, was a uh, percutaneous uh, aortic valve, uh, Maya Medical, Apama Medical, uh, and he, he, I know he's diverged into a couple of areas, but really that's his sweet spot. And each of them seems to exit in you know, less than 10 years and for hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's, it's a pretty remarkable story of a series of successful ventures of someone that's uh, uh, really specialized. Dr. Bill Hunter, he does bigger plays and sticks with them for longer. Angiotech, which was worth billions of dollars, and I went public, and now he's working on his next one, was called Canary Medical. So Angiotech was, was the, in, really the invention of the drug eluting stent, and then other related technologies. And Canary Medical, which is really about smart implants. So it diverged to a different space, but just seems to have a nose for what would be a very big story. Aggregate the IP, build a world-class team, and because of the previous success, been able to attract a great amount of capital to, uh, to pursue that in a very strong way. And the final person I'd like to highlight is Ram Rao in Southern California, who's really an ophthalmology specialist. Who, his first company was called Tomei, which was uh, uh, Corneal, corneal topography, which is used in contact lenses and a variety of other applications. Then he did AccuFocus, which is a, a corneal inlay uh, for presbyopia. And then he decided to go after the holy grail of, of uh, ophthalmology, which is the accommodating interocular lens, which is a new company called LensGen, which is on a tremendous trajectory. And we've had relationships with all these people. That's been a real pleasure and it's fun to watch their stories evolve and to then reflect a little on what lessons we can take away from their behaviors and their choices so that we can help other entrepreneurs be successful. So the takeaways that we could get from uh, some of these observations and some of the data that I'd like to highlight for you are four. First of all, somewhat surprising observation that you shouldn't be too afraid of dilution. Uh, when we look at the IPO people who've been really successful, they all took quite a lot of dilution, averaging around 60% or so in their A round. So that's a substantial amount, and yet they still did really well by picking the right venture. The next thing that I'd like to highlight is step by step. How do you, to understanding that cascade of value, always having an up round and always doing just enough to justify the valuation that, uh, that's, that is required for those investments. And probably the biggest thing I'd like to highlight sort of underlies everything is picking the right venture. We see a lot of people, as you can imagine, and sometimes they're, they're coming to us, they did their master's, their PhD in an area, now they'd like to pursue that as a medical device. And they're trying to convince themselves, or they have convinced themselves that, that their knowledge is special and, the, and thus it's worth having a, a device company around it. But in many cases, we're skeptical, and the investors ultimately are skeptical as well, because the, the numbers just don't add up. There's not really enough there. If you're going to spend 10 years on something, you want it to be something that's got some good upside potential. And uh, your knowledge will, will apply over there as well. And the final thing I'd like to highlight is that your second, third, and fourth ventures, you'll know a lot more than you know now, and your likelihood of being successful is going to go up. So, even if you don't get it totally right the first time, you need to do that in order to understand 
But it turns out there are a lot of people who would love to help you. There's in, uh, in terms of serial, other serial entrepreneurs, people would be, like to be on your board, people would like to be your advisors. You don't have to just do it by yourself. And we've seen a lot of people build really strong teams just by being aspirational like that. So those are the comments I'd like to make for you today. I hope you really enjoyed the talk.